All life on Earth is predicated on a fine ecological balance. Everything works in symphony. Changes in atmospheric pressure between ocean and Earth create a weather system that drives the planet's seasons. And for 440 million years, since the first plants produced oxygen, the atmosphere has maintained just the right conditions to nurture all life in abundance. Yet in this time, fire has also irrevocably shaped the landscape. Whole ecosystems have adapted to survive and propagate out of the ashes. But it's only been 400,000 years since Homo erectus first mastered the art of making fire. This caused a crucial turning point in the cultural evolution of modern humans. With fire, our ancestors could venture into colder regions for the first time and forge stronger tools in the heat of a flame. Nowadays, whole cities are run off the energy from coal-fired power plants, while our automobiles and airplanes rely mainly on gasoline. Our entire lives are powered by combustion. But burning fossil fuels releases heat-trapping gases into the atmosphere, which in turn increase the temperature of the planet. We know this phenomenon as global warming. Part of changing climates that bring unprecedented heat waves and devastating droughts. All of this creates excellent conditions for wildfires, which are fast becoming a central concern for growing populations living on the fringes of urbanized areas. Indeed, this most ancient of forces is a very modern problem. Therefore, understanding how wildfires work and the protocol for protecting against them is of paramount importance. For the truth is, we live on a flammable planet. And it's only getting hotter. Never before has Earth supported such a large human population. And as our numbers grow, so too should our concerns about wildfires. Continued human development requires space. Spreading cities and towns extend the borders between natural and developed areas, which are called urban wildland interfaces. These are defined as the transitional zones between urban development and unoccupied or wild land. And it is here that the threat of wildfires is most pronounced. This is due to the proximity of flammable vegetation and the increased risk of unintentional ignition of wildfires by humans. Yet urban wildland interfaces are some of the fastest growing land types in the world. In California alone, 11 million people, or more than 25% of the state's population, now live in these high-risk zones. And in Cape Town, South Africa, a city almost surrounded by mountains, there's no shortage of urban wildland interfaces. Cape Town is located in the Western Cape of South Africa. And like the Mediterranean Basin, Southwest Australia, California in the United States, and Chile in South America, it has a Mediterranean climate. This means hot, windy summers with little or no rainfall. Fire weather. This, coupled with vast areas of urban wildland interface, make it a city inadvertently designed to burn. And today, city firefighters have received a call to action. A 
fire has started on Table Mountain, a national reserve and one of the seven wonders of the world. Table Mountain holds some of the greatest floral biodiversity on the planet, with 2,200 endemic species of plants, all of which are ready to ignite in the dry summer heat. The fire was started on the northeastern slope of the saddle between Table Mountain and the buttress of Lion's Head. The battle has begun below the road, which acts as a natural control line. But there's another element to contend with. It's always a dangerous variable in the fight against wildfires. A strong breeze pushes the blaze towards the sidewalk. Wind is a primary determining factor in fire behavior because it delivers more oxygen to the flames and increases the intensity of the blaze, as well as dictating the direction in which it burns. Wildfires can exhibit extraordinary behaviors under the right circumstances, like spreading without the touch of a flame. This happens through a process called radiation, which is the transfer of heat through short energy waves that preheat and eventually combust exposed fuels. And that's exactly what happens here. After extreme preheating, Radiated heat whips over the road and carries the blaze up and over the control line, breaking through the firefighter's first line of defense. The fire is now climbing up the front of Table Mountain. the inferno gains momentum as it goes. Yet it's not just the wind causing it to pick up pace. As a rule, wildfires burn significantly faster uphill. This is due to the preheating of the material in front of the blaze, which makes it combust more readily. But the most important factor influencing the intensity of a wildfire is how much fuel is available to burn. The slopes of Table Mountain are packed with dry grasses and shrubs and dotted with stands of large pine trees. Excellent fuels for a raging fire. Understanding how wildfires move up slopes and through different fuel types helps firefighters predict fire patterns Right now, that's exactly what these firefighters must do. Because with houses nearby, this blaze has the potential to become catastrophic. The fire is now so close that residents wet their roofs down as a last line of defense. As the threat of injury through smoke inhalation increases, the neighborhood is evacuated. Luckily, support swoops in from above. Firefighting helicopters can carry up to 3,000 liters of water in a single load of their specially designed water buckets. They dispatch these water bombs on hard to reach parts of the blaze, making them some of the most indispensable weapons in the fight against wildfires. With each targeted drop, water rushes over flame, dousing whole swathes of the burn. 
But why is water so effective as a fire extinguisher? To answer this, one needs to first understand how water is formed. On a molecular level, water is produced through oxidation when hydrogen atoms combine with oxygen atoms, creating H2O. This means that water is actually made through a process of combustion, so it cannot burn again. Water is also exceptionally good at absorbing heat, and it takes a lot of energy to transform it into steam. When water comes into contact with a flame, it rapidly strips away heat, eradicating the blaze more effectively than almost anything else. Through a combination of tactical ground and aerial efforts, the blaze has been brought under control. Now the mop-up team moves in to finish off the battle by snuffing out any lingering hotspots. Severe damage to much of the surrounding vegetation was unavoidable. Yet luckily, no houses or lives were lost. The firefighters will remain on the scene for several hours after the last flame has been extinguished. This protocol is in place to guard against any unexpected flare-ups from changes in weather or unburnt fuel sources. These stoic old stone pines have remained standing through it all. They are, in fact, fire-adapted themselves, keeping their precious leaves safe from flames by holding them high in their crowns. But not all escaped unscathed. Some have been reduced to smoking ash pits. Deep holes in the ground filled with hot embers where the incinerated roots of the trees still burn. These pits are one of the dangers of fire-ravaged landscapes, and many a firefighter has sustained serious injuries stepping into them. The brave men and women who fought this fire can congratulate themselves on a well-deserved victory. Fatigued yet triumphant, they finish up a day in a life that few would willingly choose. But a firefighter's job is never done in fire season. And not far from Table Mountain, another neighborhood faces a runaway blaze. It started on the urban wildland interface between the houses and the mountain. Firefighters respond immediately. They understand the potential threat of the fire jumping the road and tag-team it, attacking the head of the blaze with high-powered hoses. These hoses can spray well over a thousand liters of water per minute and are perhaps the most iconic and indispensable tools of the firefighting trade. But as the fire ignites more of the tall trees, it becomes clear that water alone isn't going to be enough to turn the tide on this blaze. Yet the firefighters have another substance at their disposal that could be considered a flame-retarding trump card. And it's more often associated with bath time than firefighting. These helicopters are loaded with thousands of liters of specialized flame-suppressing foam. The foam is far more efficient than water in extinguishing flames because it has excellent expansion properties, allowing it to cover a wider surface area than water. This increased surface tension also gives it a longer drain time, 
which makes it even better at wetting the unburned fuels surrounding the flames. And it's lighter, so more can be carried and dropped in a single load. Overall, this makes fire suppressing foam a highly effective weapon in the fight against wildfires. And it's helped firefighters protect the people and homes of this neighborhood. But not all communities are as well protected from wildfires. This informal settlement in Cape Town is one of the most vulnerable types of community on the urban wildland interface. It's a manifestation of rapid urbanization and massive socioeconomic disparity, which can be seen across the world, especially in developing countries like South Africa. The reason informal settlements are at such risk from wildfires is due to an almost complete lack of infrastructure to deal with such disasters. Fires like this one, which started from an unknown cause in an unattended home, are no stranger to the township. They're a terrifying reality. This is the third fire here in two years, and it's by far the worst. There are several factors that make fires especially deadly in informal settlements. The first is that the houses are built out of materials that are often very flammable. They are also built extremely close together, allowing for the fire to spread rapidly from house to house. This means a blaze of mammoth proportions, burning too large and aggressively for aerial suppression to make any discernible difference. Soon the fire has enveloped large swathes of the township. The residents are forced to evacuate. Firefighters, blazes in informal settlements can be extremely challenging to fight. The roads are narrow and impede access, and burning debris and red hot metals create dangerous hazards. Despite all of this, they persevere. Eventually, the blaze is brought under control. In a short time, it's done incredible damage. More than 500 structures were lost in the fire, leaving thousands homeless. For most, there will be no insurance coverage or replacing what was lost. With so little to begin with, starting again will be harder still. It's not just cities that hold fire-prone urban wildland interfaces. Globally, some of the most high-risk spaces are agricultural lands. And when farms burn, 
the consequences are both costly and far-reaching. In the US, damage to farms from wildfires costs more than 100 million euros each year. And it's estimated that agricultural fires are more expensive than any other type of fire by 9%. The reason wildfires on agricultural lands are so costly is because they have a twofold effect. The first loss is the commercial value of the crops being burned. And when crops burn, it's a lot more than just the harvest that goes up in smoke. It's the time and labor required to cultivate them and the loss of income that would have come from selling them. The second loss is of property and farming infrastructure. Once fire has licked the land, the soil is damaged, which compromises any future crops and causes serious economic consequences. There is no denying that around the world, wildfires are becoming an increasingly urgent problem for rural and urban populations alike. In 2018 alone, there have been more than 58,000 wildfires around the world which burnt a staggering three and a half million hectares of land. And in the summer of 2018, for the first time in history, there was a fire in almost every country in Europe, with the top 10 countries experiencing a combined total of more than 5,400 wildfires between them. All of the statistics point to an undeniable rise in wildfire activity around the world. And scientists think they know why this is happening. Climate change. It's a simple enough equation. As climate change accelerates, it causes a long-term rise in temperature as well as a drop in rainfall. In practical terms, this means as climates get hotter and drier, they become more susceptible to intense wildfires. But in a world of fake news, what proof do we have that climate change is real? The scientific evidence is unequivocal. The five hottest years in human history have all taken place since 2010. Oceans are warming faster than ever before and Antarctica lost about 127 billion tons of ice every year between 1993 and 2016, with that rate tripling in the last decade. As we have pushed the Earth's temperatures up, the global fire season has increased by nearly 20% over the last 30 years. A chief agent behind this unnerving rise in temperature is carbon dioxide, and it comes from almost everything we do the machines we use, the trees we fell, the lights we power, the coal we combust. As carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, it traps the heat from the sun while still letting light waves through. This is called the greenhouse effect, and we've known about it since 1896. It's one of the primary driving forces behind global warming and tangible proof of the alarming changes humans have wrought upon the Earth in only a few hundred years. With the rise in the use of fossil fuels, the industrialization of agriculture, and the urbanization of more than half the world's population, in a short time, we've changed the very workings of the planet. In our tireless pursuit of annual profitable growth, we've put the very system that supports human life at risk. But the Earth also has forces of its own, fighting to keep its delicate balance intact. And the hero of this story isn't something that you would expect. This seemingly innocuous clump of mud stands between us and complete ecological disaster. And its name is Pete. 10,000 years ago, the last great ice age ended. As the glaciers released their icy grip on the land, a new biome entered the world, one that would change the planet forever. A very particular type of moss 
called sphagnum began to take hold in some of the shallow depressions where the glaciers once stood. And when it did, a peculiar phenomenon occurred. The melting ice filled certain catchment areas with water, and due to poor drainage, this water was low in oxygen. Sphagnum's large cell structure allowed it to absorb this water like a sponge. Because of the anaerobic conditions surrounding its growth, when the moss died, it didn't fully decompose. And this is how peat came to be. As more surrounding organic matter died, it began to accumulate in the waterlogged moss beds. When more bodies of plants were added to the pile, the stunted rate of degradation meant that they also became trapped in a state of partial decomposition, forming a curious biome of organic matter, half alive and half decomposed, with one foot in the grave and the other clinging to life. It has taken thousands of years for peat to form in swamps, and its importance cannot be overstated. Peatlands are the world's largest natural terrestrial carbon store. They cover only 3% of the globe's surface, but they remove over 350 million tons of carbon dioxide each year, storing more carbon than all other vegetation types in the world combined. Throughout history, as we have been pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, peat has been continually drawing it back. There is nothing else on planet Earth that is so effective at holding these dangerous gases. Year after year, century after century, making it the hero of the global warming story. But if you involve farming and fire, this humble hero swiftly becomes a supervillain. This smoldering landscape is what it looks like when good carbon sequesters go bad. Farmers compromised this once pristine South African peatland when they diverted the flow of a river, causing the peat to dry out. When peat dries, millennia of stored carbon becomes vulnerable. If the peat then burns, all of that carbon is released into the atmosphere. Peatland fires are a unique and extremely difficult form of wildfire to fight for one simple reason. They happen underground. This one started after an above-ground wildfire passed through the area and ignited the ancient fuel source below. For firefighters, the only way to see the subterranean inferno is with modern technology. Using drones, it's possible to get a bird's eye view of the wetland, complete with a sense of where the river runs through it and the proximity of a nearby road. But it takes thermal photography to pick up the heat signature of the fires burning below the surface. These infrared images show what was invisible to the naked eye that the peat fire is still very much alive. Peatland fires can burn for months due to peat's extremely high fuel load, steadily releasing toxic fumes and making them economic and ecological disasters. In Indonesia, a large peatland was recently drained to make way for agricultural land. The resultant peat fires cost more than 14 billion euros in damage. The fires also released more than one billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's more than Germany's entire carbon dioxide output for a whole year. Elsewhere in the world, the smoke from recent peat fires in Moscow killed an estimated 3,000 people. Peatland fires burn long and slow, far out of reach of traditional suppression methods like fire hoses or helicopter drops. This peat fire has persisted stubbornly for months on end, devouring so much underground peat that it's actually caused the ground above to collapse. And it's spreading steadily closer to the nearby road. 
Should the fire reach beneath the tar, the whole thing will crumble into the inferno beneath. In the face of imminent disaster, the latest peat fire suppression technology has been brought in. These spiked rods were first debuted during the Indonesian peat fire crisis and are uniquely designed to attack elusive peat fires. They reach deep below the surface and inject high pressure jets of water through the cracks, snuffing the fire out in the trenches. Like all trench warfare, the work is blind and so requires adept tacticians. The team targets specific areas with higher thermal heat signatures. It's hot, dangerous work that requires protection from the noxious gases. But it's an important turning point in a firefighting saga that's lasted months. Finally, using modern technology and old-fashioned perseverance, firefighters are putting an end to this potential catastrophe. For this peatland is one of South Africa's last. Not only does it regulate the functioning of the entire surrounding ecosystem, but it also sequesters large amounts of carbon from the atmosphere, playing a vital role in Earth's battle to retain balance in the face of a climate crisis. Technology has been indispensable in helping us understand the role of wildfire on Earth. It shows us that wildfire is an integral part of the planet's system as a whole, and that human activity has changed the global fire regime. But it also helps us predict when and where the next wildfire could strike. Tools like the Advanced Fire Information System, known as APHIS, and NASA's Global Fire Weather Database help governments and firefighting organizations study wildfire behavior from above. By analyzing weather data such as wind speed, temperature, and humidity, firefighting organizations can identify potential fire conditions and determine the fire danger index of a place at any given time. This makes predicting potential wildfires easier and allows officials to better mitigate fire risk to society. But even with increased capacity to monitor and assess fire behavior, technology can't protect against human error. Forensic investigations into the causes of wildfires have given us a shocking statistic. 85% of wildfires are caused by humans. When human fire ignitions are combined with drought and fuel buildup in fire-prone areas, it can spell disaster for communities in the danger zones. All of these factors are at play in the tranquil coastal town of Betty's Bay in South Africa. The tall, steep slopes behind the town are covered with dense vegetation. Which, after the most severe drought in recent history, is tinderbox dry. It's also the peak of summer.
a time when temperatures soar. Setting, weather, and fuel are primed. All that's needed is a spark to start the blaze. And that comes from human stupidity. The fire was allegedly started when a man shot a flare into the air above the mountainside. When it fell to earth, it quickly ignited the dry fuel load. In a matter of hours, the fire had climbed across the side of the mountain, precipitating an immediate response. With no suitable water sources in the area, the firefighters cannot rely on helicopters and must use hand-to-hand -hand combat against the growing flames. They're employing customized tools called fire beaters. These beaters are made of industrial strength rubber and are designed to cut off the oxygen flow to the margins of the burn with each swing. Extinguishing it bit by bit and allowing the firefighters to gain ground. But beating a fire into submission isn't easy. Especially because the flaming plants are fainboss, a vegetation type designed to burn. The intricate shrubs have dense foliage and are packed together. And the ground is lined with dry plant matter, drastically increasing the fuel load. The pleasant smells the plants normally give off on warm days are from flammable oils in their leaves. Sweet-scented geraniums and boohoos now burn with a startling readiness. All of these adaptations are in anticipation of fire, which will act as a crucial trigger that stimulates the germination of dormant seeds and clears space for bulbs buried below. This is the paradox of biomes evolved to burn. Fire is an essential part of the ecosystem. And this Feinbos region actually needs to burn. But the town below must avoid a fire at all costs. And just as the firefighters seem to be winning ground against the blaze, nature's greatest wildfire ally tips the scales. Wind can single-handedly change the face of a wildfire. It can transform it from sedate and slow-moving to roaring menace that tears across the land. In Betty's Bay, the wind has picked up to speeds in excess of 100 kilometers an hour. And it has changed direction, now blowing the blaze back towards town. These extreme conditions are unusual for the area at this time of year. And it's the very worst thing that could happen to a small town in the midst of a fiery battle. First comes the apocalyptic blanket of smoke, bringing with it hot ashes and blistering embers. When the fire hits, there's little anyone can do. Whipped into a hungry frenzy by the jet stream of wind, it devours houses whole, gutting them from the inside with flames that burn at temperatures exceeding 600 degrees Celsius. It's a spectacle of cataclysmic proportions.
for many, like this man and his family, the only thing left to do is to stay as far away from the inferno as possible. They take refuge in the shoreline close to the sea, where they will be safest. Across the town, fire rages. All must flee as their homes and possessions perish. Get in, get in, get in. Eventually, after days of burning, comes respite from above. Rain brings a small relief to the remains of the ravaged town. The Betty's Bay fire of January 2019 lasted 14 days. It incinerated 12,800 hectares of pristine vegetation, leaving scars along the mountainside. Forty-one residential homes were completely destroyed. Another 29 homes were severely damaged, with many people unable to salvage anything. Yet in time, nature's balance will prevail on the hillsides outside the town. Regeneration will come slowly to the area bringing new life from the ashes. Indeed, many of the plants here have been waiting for years for the fire to trigger their new growth cycles. But the tragedy of the lost town speaks directly to the challenges facing all of us. As the world continues to urbanize and climate change exacerbates the severity of droughts and extreme weather conditions, the risk of massive wildfires increases exponentially. And it's become clear to wildfire experts that when mega wildfires start, they're practically unstoppable. No amount of water or flame-suppressing foam will stop us from entering a new era of wildfires. Where the conflagrations will be bigger, more intense, and more frequent than ever before. Therefore, our best recourse is a proactive approach that looks at how we can start living alongside wildfire acknowledging it as one of nature's most dominant and essential forces.
for the future of our flammable planet will undoubtedly be shaped by fire.